Welcome to Unbiased Science, where we bring scientific method to the madness. We're your hosts, Dr. Jessica Steyer and Dr. Andrea Love. So last week, we applied what we discussed about research studies, specifically clinical trials, to COVID-19 research into vaccines and treatments. We reviewed the phases of clinical trials and provided a brief overview of the number of vaccine trials in each phase currently. We spent some time talking about some key phase three vaccine trials that are ongoing, uh, including a review of the status of each trial, the participant groups, and the type of vaccine technology being used. We also discussed the controversial human challenge trial, which has been proposed in the UK. Next, we reviewed clinical trials for treatments for COVID-19, and our main takeaway was <laughs> with no curative treatments or vaccines being released in the near future, the best course of action is still focusing on prevention. So that was last week. This week, we decided to take a little bit of a break from COVID and talk about GMOs. Now, this is a really hot topic, something that people seem to feel very passionately about. So before we dive into it, let's do a little icebreaker, Andrea. Um, All right. <laughs> one of the uh, this or that exercises that we did last week. So first off, amusement park or day at the beach? Oh, that's super easy for even me who's indecisive. <laughs> Definitely a day at the beach. I have lots of social anxiety and amusement parks seem like one of the worst places for me. Oh my gosh. Same here. This was very easy for me. And I'm also terrified of roller coasters. I have this phobia of slipping through the seatbelts <laughs> and falling out. And so yes, stick me on I, the beach. I love roller coasters, but I would really only enjoy an amusement park and the roller coasters if there were no other people there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That's, that's like, um, what is that movie? The Griswolds, you know, vacation where they go yeah, anyway. Oh, anyway. Okay. Um, next up hamburger or taco. Oh, that's tough. I'm, I'm, I'm not a super huge fan of either to be honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I do like, Certain types of Tex-Mex, I would say maybe if it's a soft taco, I'd go with that or a fish taco, perhaps. Oh, my um, gosh, Andrea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm like, I love both so much. How do I pick? Oh, my gosh. I love a good cheeseburger, um, but I'm married to a Southern Californian guy, and I think that now I just have this love of, of Mexican food, and so I have to go taco, but very tough for me. <laughs> um, okay. Glasses or contacts? Well, if anybody's ever seen a picture of me, they're going to have to guess glasses, and that would be right. I do have contacts, but I have a, a chronic dry eye issue, and they're extremely uncomfortable, so mm -hmm. I've opted with the glasses route. And you know, Andrea, I've told you, I'm super jealous. You just, you have like the perfect face for glasses. They just look so beautiful on you for, I have a super narrow face and they just, it just does not work. So I have to vote contacts on this and I'm, I think I'm legally blind if you go by my vision. <laughs> and so, yeah, so I'm always, I've always got my contacts popped in. Um, okay. I think this is very easy for both of us, but humor me big party okay. or small gathering. Oh, for sure. A small <laughs> gathering. Again, social anxiety. Same. You know, keep it, keep it cozy. <laughs> Same. I don't know if I'm an extroverted introvert or an introverted extrovert, but yeah, big parties are like my nightmare. I leave yes. totally exhausted and drained. Yes. So. Yeah. I need like a day and a half to recharge after all that um, socializing. Same. All right. Last one. And this one's important. Uh, cake or pie? Ah. <laughs> uh. I think I'm going to have to go with pie. I'm not a super huge fan of traditional kind of like spongy cakes. Um, I, I do like a good tres leches and I'm on the mm. quest to find the best tres leches in the area here. But I would say just kind of broadly speaking, I'd have to go with pie. See, and I, I've got to go cake. I, I do <laughs> love an apple pie a la mode. Oh, my goodness. But I love spongy cakes. Give me a funfetti cake or a red velvet <laughs> with cream cheese frosting. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> See, I would have the a la mode or the mm. frosting. Um, I would definitely choose ice cream out of everything. Oh, my God. And now I'm starving. Um, okay. So... 
today we're switching gears, um, not because the pandemic is over. Um, in fact, we're seeing record number of cases across the country. Um, but we wanted to give everyone, including ourselves, a little mind break uh, with all the COVID and election saturation. But fear not, we will be back to COVID-related topics in the future. Um, and Andrea, I think you wanted to give everyone a yeah. little... <laughs> In the meantime, yeah. please keep wearing your masks and practicing social distancing and other hygiene practices so we can try and reduce these uh, case spikes that we're seeing right now. Yes, 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 yes. Um, okay, so as I said, today we're going to talk about GMOs. So Andrea, do you want to kick things off? Sure. Yeah. So I think, you know, we really want to set the stage about what what that term actually means. So GMO is an acronym and it stands for genetically modified organisms. Um, and so I really want to take a moment to kind of break that down. What does that actually mean? So when we think about the word genetic, um, we're thinking about the genome or the, the universal language of an organism. So anything that's genetically modified simply means that the genome, so in the case of of every organism um, on the planet, that's DNA, with the exception of RNA for viruses, which are not technically an organism. Um, but what it means is, is that the DNA of that organism has been changed from its historical sequence or its historical genome to something slightly different. Um, and so why does this really matter? So the genome is what we call this universal language of all living organisms. So the DNA of our cells and the cells of your pet, the cells of plants that you eat, the cells of meat that you eat, whatever the case happens to be, the DNA that's inside all of the, the cells that exist is converted into another molecule called RNA through a process called transcription. And then that RNA, which is kind of an intermediate language, um, that becomes our ex expressed genes. These are converted into proteins, which is really the functional unit of our genome. So ultimately, the genome is this language that then encodes proteins and other sorts of molecules that lead to functional organisms. So by taking the genome, by changing it through this process of genetic modification, we can ultimately change the genes that are expressed and the proteins um, that are produced to something different. Um, go ahead, Jess. Well, I was just going to say, you know, of course, our, our ancestors had no concept of genetics, but they were still able to influence the DNA of other organisms by a process called selective breeding or artificial selection. Um, these were terms coined by Charles Darwin, and they described the process of choosing organisms with the most desired traits and mating them with the intention of combining and propagating these traits through their offspring. Uh, repeated use of this practice over many generations um, can result in dramatic genetic changes to a species. So while artificial selection is not what we typically consider GMO technology today, it's still the precursor to the modern processes and the earliest example of our species influencing genetics. Um, yeah, absolutely, yep. Jess. And um, and I think the the point the another point to be made here is that this artificial selection is is us or some other external force controlling what is reproducing as opposed to what we hear a lot of times um, of natural selection, which ultimately drives kind of natural evolution. But all of these processes ultimately um, selective re or sexual reproduction is technically um, modifying the genome through generations. So did you want to give us a little um, history lesson here on modern genetics? And Yeah, sure. <laughs> so so does anybody, any of our listeners, I hope some of them remember Gregor Mendel and his pea plants. But I if do. you don't, I'm going <laughs> to... Are you having nightmares with Punnett yes. Squares? I, I sure am. I'm sure you got A pluses in all of those courses, Andrea. Um, yeah, so take it away. I won't tell you what I got in those classes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so Gregor Mendel was, is, is roughly considered to be the father of modern genetics. Um, he was a scientist and he actually was, was a friar at a monastery. And while he was at that monastery in the mid 1800s, um, he began a decade long experiment and he was really interested in studying the patterns and the concept of inheritance. And so inheritance is basically when a trait or a characteristic is passed down from one generation to another through 
sexual reproduction. Um, and so, you know, all organisms with the exception of bacteria um, and a few others um, have the capacity to reproduce sexually, meaning you have two distinct parents. They're going to mate with each other and they're going to produce a unique offspring. Um, so he was really interested to understand why or what actually contributed to the changes that you see over generations. So he he was working with a few different model systems, including honeybees and mice, but he ended up settling on pea plants. And pea plants um, were chosen for a few reasons. One, of course, plants are very easy to work with in the context of research. Um, and, and because they had well-defined phenotypes. And phenotypes is the physical characteristic of an organism. So for these pea plants, they had very, very defined characters like the color of the peas themselves, the size and shape of the pea pods, the orientation and the colors of the blossoms on the pea plants, um, and also the height of the plants themselves. So he was able to establish um, these pure breeding lines. So these are plants that basically are producing identical offspring. So these are kind of your, we call these parental. Um, and so he took those to basically crossbreed with each other. So he's creating artificial hybrids and a hybrid is just a combination of two different a pure species. And so when he was doing these sorts of crossbreeding experiments, he monitored the different traits that were emerging in the offsprings. Uh, and he was looking at the quality of those traits, the proportion of the traits uh, and which ones were expressed and which ones were hidden. Um, and this this decade long experiment was how he was able to identify what we call dominant and recessive traits. So dominant traits are ones that are going to um, show over a different version of that trait. So things like hair color, eye color in the case of humans, um, you know, with his case, these are things like the, the height of the plant, the color of the peas, et cetera. Um, and, and he also identified that these traits were in fact heritable, meaning these were passed down to different offspring um, in a very logical and methodical process. So these hybrids, these crossbred plants led to different plants with different traits. Um, and that's this concept of heritability um, and ultimately the foundation for genetics or genetic inheritance. So he actually published this data in 1866, but it really took another 30 years for this to be widely appreciated and ultimately accepted. Um, but the reason that this is important is that these types of experiments that he did actually established that these cross bred plants, um, these hybrid plants, these are actually genetically modified, right? So in a historical sense, anytime we selectively breed an organism where we pick particular creatures that have uh, an advantageous characteristic, this leads technically to a genetically modified organism or a GMO. Um, and this really includes almost everything we eat today. Um, we wouldn't have tomatoes as we know them. We wouldn't have bananas as we know them. We wouldn't have carrots as we know them. Um, the wild versions of those plants are, they create inedible fruits. So we actually domesticated those. So that's another term for this ancient form of genetic modification in order to have produce um, to eat and consume uh, as we know today. And Andrea, I know we, we, we said this before we started recording, but we really have to dig up um, a photo of what corn would look like <laughs> if it were not, uh, you know, uh, genetically modified. So let's see if we can yeah, that Yeah, I mean, a, a wild <laughs> carrot, a wild carrot looks like a tree root. I mean, it's just it's very, wow. very, <laughs> um, very surprising. <laughs> so basically what we're trying to say is that, you know, this has been going on for thousands of years. Um, humans have been using traditional modification methods like what Andrea described, selective breeding, crossbreeding um, to breed plants and animals with more desirable, desirable traits. Um, and so I know you just gave some examples. Um, corn is one that really stands out because I have this visual that I know is circulating for a while of, you know, non-GMO corn, um, but also strawberries. You know, strawberries are a cross between a, a species native to North America and um, a strawberry species native to South America. So as Andrea said, um, really a lot of what we eat <laughs> has been genetically modified. Um, the, oh, sorry, were you going to jump in? No, no, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say that, um, you know, of course, we've been talking about how things have been done over the past 
thousands of years, but of course we've come a long way and as science and technology have advanced, we've become more strategic and faster about modifying the genome of organisms. So instead of randomly breeding two organisms together and seeing what happens, um, we now have these incredible techniques and are able to alter a tiny piece of DNA, um, knowing precisely what that change will do and um, create create that change in a single generation instead of tens, hundreds, or even thousands of generations. So Andrea, can you talk to us a little bit about how we do this? So in order to actually create these genetically modified organisms, there's a few different methods depending on the type of organism. But ultimately, the basic process is we have to identify the trait of interest that we want to convey to the organism. So is it the ability to produce um, a protein like insulin? Is it the ability to produce a natural insect repellent? Is it the ability to produce a specific vitamin that, say, the, the plant didn't have, didn't produce previously? Um, and, and as I mentioned, all of these traits are ultimately genes. So these traits have a gene associated with it. So that's a piece of DNA that's ultimately turned into a functional, um, you know, building block of the organism. So we identify that trait, we identify that sequence of DNA, and we copy that piece of DNA, that sequence that encodes that trait that we want. Once we have that copy, then we insert that piece of DNA into the cells of the organism we want to, to modify. So this could be plant cells, this could be bacterial cells, it could be animal cells. Again, it really depends on the organism in question. Um, and there are a few ways to physically insert that piece of DNA. And again, that depends on the gene itself and also the organism involved. And, I, and I'm not going to get too much into that. But ultimately, that's done in the lab using a few different technologies that we have available. Once that's done, once we insert that piece of DNA, we also we then have to grow and we monitor that new organism. Um, and that process of growing and monitoring also undergoes a lot of review, a lot of testing. We want to make sure, of course, that the trait of interest is expressed, that it's present, it's functioning as it should, um, and also that the organism is functionally the same as it was before with the addition of just that new trait. And that process of testing and review has been defined by the FDA, of course. We're going to go through kind of the timeline of genetic engineering. Um, but this process of, of testing and review ultimately takes several years during the development of this new organism. Um, and I think here it's really important to, to also mention, you know, we've talked about selective breeding and how, how we've done that. Um, and we also want to mention that these genetically modified organisms don't just exist in agriculture. Uh, we're going to talk about a few specific examples, um, such as bacteria and how they were so critical for certain key medical developments. But also, you know, dog and cat breeds are genetically modified. And I think, Jess, you want to take us through a little history of yeah. that? Yeah, so I came across this um, this piece uh, that Harvard published called From Corgis to Corn, A Brief Look at the Long History of GMO Technology. Um, and it was great. It described how the dog is thought to be the first organism our ancestors um, actually artificially selected. So around 32,000 years ago, while our ancestors were still hunters and gatherers, um, wild wolves in East Asia joined groups of humans as scavengers. Um, they were domesticated and then artificially selected to increase docility, um, leading to dogs that are closely related to what um, are currently known as Chinese native dogs. Um, over thousands of years, um, various traits such as size, hair length, co color, and body shape were artificially selected for, um, altering the genetics of these domesticated descendants of wolves so much that we now have breeds. You know, Andrew, we were joking, like, think about a pug or a chihuahua <laughs> or a corgi. They obviously barely resemble wolves. Um, one of my dogs is actually half corgi, and it's just, I, I have these three dogs that look nothing alike. They look nothing like wolves, but they still howl like wolves. So it's in there somewhere. Um, but uh, since this time, artificial selection has uh, obviously, as we've discussed and will continue to discuss, been applied to so many different species um, and has helped us develop all sorts of animals from prize winning racehorses to muscular beef cattle to the dogs and cats that we call pets today. 
Yeah. And what I think is really funny, Jess, is that if you look at kind of the history of selective breeding, especially in pet animals, um, dogs were domesticated thousands of years before cats were. And I, and I feel like you can see that in some of their behavior, right? Dogs tend to be, you know, you envision dogs to be much more kind of person oriented, whereas cats still have a lot of that almost wild instinct still, still present. So true. So true. So, um, Andrew, do you think that we should next talk uh, or just give a brief history of uh, GM technology? Yeah, sure. So again, you know, we we're, we're using genetically modified GMOs, not in the context of what you see on food labels in the grocery store. Um, we're going to get into that in, in more detail, probably on a future episode. We'll talk a little bit about it today, but we're talking more in the context of genetic engineering and, and genetic modification technology. So, you know, we really can say it probably started in 1866 after Gregor Mendel had completed his pea plant breeding experiments. And he really set the stage for this concept of heritable variations in plants. And ultimately, now we know that that is truly heritable variations in really all organisms. Um, So again, as I mentioned, it took about 30 years from that publication in 1866 to start to gain some traction. Um, But in 1922, the first hybrid corn was, was grown and sold. So this is when, again, you do this artificial selection and the selective breeding to create a hybrid product and, and ultimately here a hybrid food. Um, and that kind of evolved over the years. So in the in the 1940s, um, people that were doing plant breeding, so hybridization, selective breeding, they were actually using a, a t- technique or a process called mutagenesis breeding, which is what they do um, by exposing the seeds of plants to radiation or chemicals. And the exposure to radiation and chemicals actually changes the DNA. It leads to mutations in the DNA. Um, and that's actually an, an older, and but another way to genetically modify things. And so this actually... And- Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. Sorry, no, if I could just, sorry to, to jump in here, but um, I love eating ruby red grapefruits. And I know that mutagenesis was actually the process that helped us deepen the color of ruby red and star ruby grapefruits. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great point. You know, so, <laughs> so you know, if we talk again, you know, marketing and labeling is is a whole, whole other can of worms. Um, but if we talk about genetic modified organisms, that's a great example. And, and mutagenesis breeding is, is again, extremely random. You're just exposing these seeds and seeing what happens. Um, whereas in the lab, when we use DNA modification technologies, it's a lot more strategic and, and it's a lot more well-known. But, but in the 40s, we didn't know anything about that. We actually didn't discover DNA until 1953, uh, thanks to Watson Crick. And let's give props to Rosalind Franklin as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> Um, And so once DNA was discovered, once the structure of DNA was discovered and identified to really be that heritable material, that, that, you know, universal language in organisms, um, it took about 20 years for, for Boyer and Cohen, Herbert Boyer and Stanley Cohen to create the first genetically modified organism. And this happened to be um, E. coli. So that's a bacteria. Um, Jess, I think you have something to say about that. Just super quick. This this was just sort of, you know, known as an enormous breakthrough in GMO technology um, when these scientists worked together to engineer the first um, successful genetically engineered organism. So they developed a method to very specifically cut out a gene from one organism and paste it into another, as Andrea described. Um, And using this method, they transferred a gene that encodes antibiotic resistance from one strain of bacteria into another, um, bestowing antibiotic resistance resistance upon the recipient. So that was just a huge breakthrough. And and then I know you're going to take us, you're going to jump forward again in time and take us to our first genetically modified product. Yeah. So E. coli, you know, they're about, it's a bacterium. Um, It's a single celled organism. It doesn't have a nucleus. It's obviously, it's a little bit easier to work with and say plant cells and animal cells as well. But, you know, it really set the stage for a lot of technology that we use for, for, tons of research these days. Um, and E. coli is very unique because it has these little pieces of DNA that it, it can exchange pretty regularly. Um, and that really led to the development of the, the truly first genetically modified product on the market. And contrary to what you might suspect, it was not a food. It was human insulin. 
Um, so human insulin is a requirement for type 1 diabetics. So type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disorder where the cells in the pancreas that produce insulin are destroyed by our, by our immune systems. So this, this need to get routine injections or infusions of insulin for people that have type 1 diabetes is absolutely critical. Before 1982, diabetics were using pig and cow insulin. And the reason they were using this is because they were most similar to human insulin. They had a couple of variation variants compared. But because of these slight variations, people often had um, allergic reactions to it because it's not, it's not native. It's not human species. Um, and so being able to engineer E. coli bacteria, which are the organisms that now produce human insulin, was a groundbreaking achievement in genetically modified engineering technology. Um, nowadays, we produce human insulin still to this day in E. coli primarily. So that's bacteria. We also sometimes do produce human insulin in yeast cells as well, which is a single-celled fungal organism. Um, so again, that 1982 really set the stage. Human insulin revolutionized medical care, revolutionized GM technology. Um, after that, you know, in the mid 80s, 86, um, guidelines were released regarding regulation of genetic engineering technology to ensure and have oversight for safety of these products. Um, in 1992, FDA um, released regulations stating that that same sort of criteria would be transferred to food products. So again, before then, we were still working in the realm of medical, you know, medical treatments, so human insulin. So FDA released regulations that said, um, you know, the G any GM foods were able to produce, so whether that be, you know, corn, um, fruits, whatever, had to fulfill that same sort of criteria, safety, um, nutritional benefits, et cetera, as, as your hybrid or traditionally bred plants. Um, and that really paved the way for the first genetically modified food. And this was the tomato released in 1994. This was called the flavor saver tomato. Um, <laughs> and, and of course, there was a ton of research and data demonstrating that this flavor saver tomato was safe. Um, but this gene, this genetic modification was actually to delay rotting um, after picking this tomato. And what that does is it prolongs the shelf life and enables access for consumers to, to get these tomatoes in. In, in their stores. Um, and, and throughout the 1990s, there was a huge wave of food products that were developed and released that included things like papayas, corn, squash, soybeans, potatoes. And again, as I mentioned, just like the flavor saver tomato, most of the genetic modifications or these GM foods were things that um, produced um, inherent resistance to a virus or a pest, which reduces the need to spray chemical pesticides, or it had things like prolonged shelf life or it included things like they're starting to produce a vitamin or a mineral that the, the food product normally didn't produce. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about that later. Um, but ultimately, most of these goals were to either improve crop production, increase consumer access, or um, you know, improve the, the nutritional or safety benefits of, of the food. Um, Jess, you want to briefly kind of mention where some of the food controversy um, starts? Um, sure. I mean, just to lay it all out there, this is a very controversial topic. And um, I think that, you know, anytime we're dealing with things that people don't fully understand, honestly, you, know, you hear like genetically modified or anything related to to chemicals or just anything that people don't fully understand. There's, you know, there's this real pushback. And just before we get into it, um, I'm sure you've seen this meme that circulates and it's, you know, would you put this in your body? And it's a, it's a list of the, um, a bunch of chemicals. And it turns out, you well, and of course, you know, the response to that is, no, I would never put that in my body. I would never ingest that. And it turns out to be just the chemical breakdown of a banana. Um, I know that's not directly <laughs> relevant to what we're talking about here with GMOs, but I feel like it's, it's um, related. So anyway, there have been a lot of uh, controversies regarding uh, GE technology with the majority relating to food, of course. Um, while some critics object to the use of this technology based on religious or philosophical bases, um, most critics object on the basis of environmental or health concerns. Um, but I, I 
took a look at, at the science there. And, and actually, um, from the majority of what I was able to dig up, GMOs allow farmers to produce more food with fewer inputs. So they help us spare land, reduce deforestation, and promote and reduce chemical use. Um, they also allow plants and foods, etc., to be grown with additional nutrients um, or nutrients that these foods didn't have before. So there is something called golden rice. Um, I think it's it's uh, being created in Asia. I don't know if you know about mm-hmm. it, Sandra, yep. but um, for folks who have a vitamin A deficiency, um, anyway, that's just one example. Um, G- uh, GE also allows food to last longer, as you were just talking about tomatoes with a longer shelf life, without rotting, um, and improves access to foods for people all around the world. So there are benefits of genetically modified crops to sustainability and the environment. So yeah. absolutely. Oh, sorry. Yes. No, I was just going to mm-hmm. say, you know, you know, there, there's obviously controversy. Um, a lot of people, you know, some of it's based in, in a lack of understanding of the technology, but, you know, this kind of led to the WHO and the FAO, which is the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, um, to develop global guidelines for GM products. And that was in the early 2000s and 2003. Um, and so that really sets the stage for safety, um, you know, nutritional benefits, all the sorts of criteria that you would expect for any sort of, you know, lab produced um, treatment product, et cetera. So all of the same sort of regulations, safety oversight that you th- you see in things like cancer treatments or vaccines, um, they're also being implemented for GM technologies. And, and genetically modified foods actually have much more research and safety studies done than any other type of food that's available. Um, So truly, you know, a lot of work is being put in to ensure that other than that one advantageous trait, everything else is the same. Um, So in 2005, um, genetically modified alfalfa and sugar beets were now available. And in 2015, this is a really interesting thing because we had the first FDA approval for genetically modified animal. And this happens to be a salmon. Um, and so this salmon actually includes a gene that has a hormone for a hormone that enabled the salmon to grow much bigger and actually grow year round. So typically wild salmon don't grow year round. They only grow essentially during breeding season. Um, and, and by being able to genetically engineer a salmon that can be farm raised, not wild raised, um, but also grow year round, it actually led or leads to a more sustainable solution, um, for human consumption, especially as our global population grows. Um, Something interesting about the salmon, um, this was actually created in 1989, but it took almost 20 years to get that FDA approval. And that really underscores the rigorous review for safety and nutrition that these types of products um, go through. Um, In 2017, GM apples officially go on sale. And in 2019, the FDA completed consultation on a food um, that was from a genetically modified plant. So what this actually was, was the plant itself was a soybean plant. And we were producing soybean oil from that plant. So basically, it's a Mm. byproduct of a genetically engineered organism. So, um, you know, as just mentioned, again, there's a lot of controversy uh, about it. Ultimately, the the safety data is there. Mm-hmm. Um, the the benefit, the beneficial data is also there, and I think we're going to talk about a few examples. Uh, is that right, Jess? We sure are. <laughs> so look, we're going to talk about. Well, actually, let me just throw out some stats because you know I love me some stats. Yeah, um, let's do it. So, so in 2016 alone, um, GMO cro- growing GMO crops helped decrease CO2 emissions equivalent to taking 16.7 million cars off the road for an entire year. That stat, I thought that was really yeah. incredible. Um, yeah, it remarkable. also right it. it Oh, were you going to say something? No, no, I was just going to say nope. it's it's really remarkable. Yeah. <laughs> It is. It really, really is. Um, it also, GMOs also reduce the amount of pesticides that need to be sprayed um, while simultaneously increasing the amount of crops available to be eaten and sold. Um, over the last 20 years, it's estimated that GMOs have reduced pesticide applications by 8.2% and increased crop yields by 22%. Um, and other studies have shown a new disease-resistant GMO potato um, 
um, for example, could reduce fungicide use by up to 90%. Now, Jess, can uh, I jump yeah. in here really quickly? Yes, I just want to, I think I, I want to emphasize the fact that the reason we don't have to spray as many pesticides or fungicides is because these genetic modifications are enabling the plants themselves to produce a natural fungal repellent or insect repellent so that you don't actually have to spray them with chemicals. So it's actually benefiting us as consumers as well as things like groundwater and whatnot because we don't have pesticide runoff into those water sources. That's a really important point. Thanks for chiming in with that. Um, genetically engineering can also be used to reduce food waste. Uh, it's associated with environmental impact, of course. We know food waste and um, environmental impact go hand in hand. Um, examples include non-browning mushrooms, apples, and potatoes, um, but also can be expanded to include perishable fruits. Um, there's also tremendous potential in regard to genetically engineered animals, um, such as pigs, that produce less phosphorus material. So uh, we're going to talk in just a minute a little bit more about, um, you know, our GMO safe to eat just briefly, and then we're going to do a deep dive uh, in, a, in a future episode. But um, from a health perspective, GMO food is no different than GMO food. Um, in fact, they can even be healthier. So uh, imagine peanuts that can be genetically engineered to reduce levels of, and I'm probably butchering this, um, aflatoxin and gluten-free wheat, which would give, did I butcher that, no, Andrew? No, you did didn't. It correct it's not okay. aflatoxin, that's <laughs> okay, there you go. Say that three times quickly. Um, and, you know, that would give those with celiac disease um, a, a healthy and tasty bread option. Um, GM corn has cut levels of naturally occurring mycotoxin, which causes both health problems and economic losses by a third. Um, and then, you know, earlier I referenced other GM GMO foods such as this um, vitamin A enriched golden rice. We can fortify foods with vitamins and nutrients and minerals to create healthier staple foods and help prevent malnutrition. Now, Jess, you know, golden rice to me was really one of the most staggering um, things I learned in one of my early undergrad uh, genetics classes, because if you look at many of these Asian countries whose diets are almost predominantly white rice, white rice is almost devoid of nutrients other than just calories, right? And mm. by being able to produce a type of rice that now has some of these essential, you know, vitamins, vitamin A is very critical for healthy, you know, function. Um, it's just truly a remarkable because it doesn't require them to completely alter their agricultural economy. They're still growing rice in patties, but now mm -hmm. they have this option that is going to be healthier. That is so incredible. Uh, imagine the impact that that could make on, on this population. Um, so the overwhelming consensus of scientific experts um, and major scientific authorities around the world is that GMOs are safe to eat. Um, there have been more than 1,700 studies on the safety of e GMOs, many of which, hundreds of which, were independently funded before folks go ahead and say that, you know, they're <laughs> industry sponsored and something like that. Um, so in the spring of 2016, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine researched this question, and they concluded, yes, GMOs are safe. Um, there was a panel of more than 20 scientists, researchers, agricultural and industry experts. They reviewed over 20 years of data since GMOs were, were introduced, including nearly 900 studies and tests in European and North American health data. And they concluded uh, that GMOs and genetically modified crops are safe to eat. They have the same nutrition and composition as non-genetically modified crops and have no new links to allergies, cancer, celiac, or other diseases. Yeah. And I think, Jess, that's a great point to make because I think a lot of times people um, don't make the connection about what this actually means. So again, just to kind of take it back a second, all we're doing is introducing a, a another sequence of DNA into the cell of that organism. And that piece of DNA ultimately is going to lead to the production of a particular protein or some sort of molecule that has that heritable, that, that trait that we want, right? Um, we're not injecting, you know, foods. We're not doing any sorts of things. And it, that food is simply going to have that new quality. So in the case of, you know, the tomato, now it's not going to rot as quickly. Um, when you eat an organism, when you eat a food, when you eat a tomato, 
all of the DNA of that tomato gets digested in your stomach, in your digestive tract. So, you know, it's completely logical that genetically modified organisms are not going to have any of these links to any sort of deleterious medical mm-hmm. conditions when you compare it to, you know, a more conventional crop. So just to re- reiterate, research by scientists across the world has found no relationship between GMOs and mutations, um, organ health and function unaffected by GMOs, no evidence for gene transfer between GMOs and consumers, and fertility, pregnancy, and offspring are unaffected by GMOs. Um, I've yes, heard a, a lot. Yeah, that's sorry. A great point to make. Gene transfer, just to 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 clarify for everybody, is that the gene in the GMO is transferred to the person eating it. Again, as I mentioned, when you eat something, you digest all of the the DNA in that piece of food. So that's that's getting broken down pretty much instantly. Um, and, and obviously, you know, then that gene is, is no longer in existence. So, um, Andrea, in a second, I'm going to turn things over to you because I feel like we absolutely have to address, um, you know, the business practice controversy mm-hmm. around mm-hmm. GMOs um, and, you know, the M word that comes to mind, I think, when, when people... Um, hear about GMOs. But I just wanted to to throw out there that, uh, you know, again, I think the focus, as you said, Andrea, is is um, is always on food. Um, but there are so many non-food GMOs that I just wanted to point out because I think people would be surprised how common they are um, in all of our daily lives. So some examples um, in the laundry room, we have uh, genetic engineering boosts our detergent. Enzymes enhanced through genetic engineering help remove protein stains, grease, and starches. Um, We have biodegradable diapers, which I think is incredible. That's an innovation with genetic engineering. Um, It, uh, the microbes break down, no, excuse me, microbes break down the materials in the diaper after use, making it biodegradable. That's huge. Um, Genetically modified soy products are a popular alternative to paper and plastic products. Um, For example, soy-based straws, which are biodegradable, um, and genetically modified soybeans, uh, which also conserve water and uh, use fewer insecticides. Um, I think you were talking earlier about corn and soybeans that are used to make biofuels. Biofuels are less expensive fuels for cars and machinery that are better for the environment. They're greener. They burn cleaner. They use fewer resources. Um, And uh, Andrea, you already touched on this, but we have to acknowledge GMOs being common in medicine. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, you talked about insulin. That's, That's absolutely huge. And there are so many other modern treatments that uh, incorporate GMOs that benefit humans, animals, um, and the world. Yeah, I mean, we have <clears throat> we have entire foundations of modern medicine that are that are based a- around you know modifying the genome of organisms and and ultimately you know potentially people when we talk about things like gene therapy where we're trying to replace a dysfunctional gene with the functional version to cure a medical issue. Um, So, you know, truly, you know, genetic modification, GMO, as the acronym stands, really means a lot more than than what many people hear about in the context of, you know, consumer based uh, food products. And we are going to obviously talk a lot more about um, some of that in detail on a future episode. Um, you know, I know we've we've talked a lot about kind of the overview of genetic engineering technology and what a genetically modified organism truly is, um, how that, you know, it's evolved from selective breeding over the years. Um, you know, and and I think something that's worth mentioning is that we do need to talk about, you know, controversies around GMOs, particularly with regard to business practices. And so I'm sure a lot of people, particularly those that are opposed to genetically modified organisms or GM technology, have heard about Monsanto. So Monsanto is a major player in the agricultural industry. Um, they're a producer of pesticides as well as genetically modified crops. Um, and they sell these and these are patented um, by Monsanto. So you know, these products are used in agricultural industry. Um, and, and of course, you know, with business practices, there's always scandals. Now we're going to do a lot deeper dive on that at a future episode. Um, but ultimately there, there has been a lot of criticism from Monsanto specifically or of Monsanto specifically. Um, 
I think something to keep in mind, um, you know, we'll talk more about uh, Roundup and and some of the other sorts of products that are associated with these scandals. Um, but the big thing is, is that GM technology, genetic, genetically modified organisms, um, you know, refer to the technology itself. The Monsanto story and the, you know, affiliated potential scandals of Monsanto um, has much less to do with the GM technology and more to do with questionable business practices. Um, So that's something that, you know, we're going to do a much more thorough breakdown on that, um, as well as some misconceptions on a future episode. Okay. (laughs) So should I do a just a summary of today's episode and some takeaways or did you have something else to add? Add, Andrea, no, before I think that. I think that's a that's a good point here. Um, you know, certainly we could talk about GMOs for a very long time, but I think it's a yes. good, good place to wrap up this episode. And just one final thing, I feel like whenever you talk about GMOs, it seems to go hand in hand with a discussion about organic foods, and that's going to have its own at least it's one episode dedicated solely to organic foods. So just wanted yeah, to mention that. I think yeah. I think it's a great point, Jess. You know, and ultimately, organic versus GMO are really apples to orange. Organic Mm -hmm. refers to something related to the growing of a particular, you know, agricultural product, whereas genetically modified organisms really have to do with the breeding of an organism. So they're really not even in the same vein with regard to food products. So, okay. What are some of the takeaways from today's episode? GMOs are prevalent in many everyday consumer products that we use. Uh, Genetic modification technology has been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, It's the reason that we have fruits and vegetables as we know them, dog breeds, cat breeds, etc. The method of genetic modification has changed over the years, uh, obviously, as science and technology advance and grow. Um, But the principle is the same. Uh, And the new technology is simply faster and and more specific. So just because you hear something is genetically modified does not mean it's dangerous. Um, In many instances, as we discussed, GMOs are helping us live greener and healthier lives. And more than two decades of research prove that GMOs are safe for humans, animals, and the environment. It's a great point, Jess, Um, you know, and I hope everybody kind of keeps that in mind when they're sourcing different products and and thinking about some of the the things that they consume on a regular basis. Um, Thanks for joining us today. We hoped you learned a thing or two. And if you like our pod, please share with your friends and family and also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. In our next episode, we're going to apply this information discussed today about GM technology to a discussion about misconceptions about GMOs, including things about labeling and some of the controversy sound around some big companies in the GM um, sector. Catch you next time on the pod, your trusted source for no-nonsense, just science.